Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, what, uh, 24th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. I think this is video number three for the day. Some days I just have too much stuff rolling around in my head. And I was thinking, I can't remember was it this morning or when it was, but then I just remembered it. Uh, in regard to the Catholic Church and the current circumstances there with with uh, Pope, Pope Bergoglio, yes, he seems to be doing everything he can to... What is he trying to do other than to turn it into ashes? I don't know. It's difficult to say what his end game is other than he's destroying everything. Um, he's sort of the, the Israeli RDF in the Catholic Church. Bulldozers and tanks. Yes. And I, I've, uh, oh, I, I see that one of the, uh, his protagonists, or, or is it antigen? I don't know. To Francis, uh, the Vortex uh, media site, which has been solidly conservative Catholic and anti-Francis, well, uh, the the founder of that just bit the dust the other day and had to resign for <clears throat> sexual misconduct. So uh, seems to be a lot of that going on. But sp him compared to what goes on inside the Roman Catholic priesthood is like, what? <laughs> Nothing. You know. <clears throat> but thinking about the Roman uh, Catholics... Uh, I mean, I, I have a certain sympathy for the conservatives because you know, Francis and the others. But the problem is there's no salvation inside of Roman Catholicism. There's only salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm sure some Catholics are trusting in him rather than trusting in the institution. But I fear that most most Catholics are trusting in the institution and uh, I married into a family of Roman Catholics. The, the, uh, the parents, at least, were devout Roman Catholics. Children, not so much, including my wife. But uh, uh, she's no longer Roman Catholic. <laughs> Didn't really want to be one then. But, as I've, so, but I studied Roman Catholicism before I, I got married, and I've kept an eye on it ever since. When we were down in the Rio Grande Valley, of course, most people were Roman Catholics down there. And I've noticed from my personal experience with my in-laws, um, again, they were fairly devout, uh, going to Mass every Sunday. My father-in-law, when he was at assisted living, he would... He'd be waiting for the uh, the nun to come around with the with the bread consecrated wafer for him. Uh, he put his hope and trust in the church, and I suspect that is where most Roman Catholics have their faith in the institution of the church. And they look at Pope Francis and like the priests, and they say, "Well, the church is not corrupt. The church is perfect, but it has lots of corrupt and imperfect people in it." That is their usual explanation. So, what do you do when the Pope is corrupt and imperfect, as they always are? Well, that causes some stress. And the, the conservative reaction to Francis has been pulling their hair out. Okay, what does that tell me? I was, when I was thinking about this, and it suddenly occurred to me, I'm right. I'm right that the trust of most Catholics is in the institution. That's why Francis is driving them nuts, because they're trusting in the institution of the church and its sacraments rather than trusting directly in Jesus Christ. That's what's going on. That's why they're in such a panic. The very thing they're putting their faith in, and Catholics have had their faith in for generations. The institution, with its sacraments, with its priesthood, is now being raised to the ground, Israeli style, by Pope Francis. So their hope of salvation is evaporating because it's in a man made institution. 
Occam ra- Occam's razor, right? Uh, <laughs> simplest explanation is usually the correct one. It makes sense. From my personal experience, Roman, ca- uh, Roman Catholics are trusting in the institution of the church. From what I've heard talking to Roman Catholic priests, that's pretty much the same thing. Uh, and, you know, studying it, my own experience with family, other things, it's to trust in the institution and their sacraments. That is it. it individual priests, individual popes, you know, they, they say, well, that doesn't matter as long as the institution there is there. But Pope Francis is attacking the institution. He's attacking the Mass. That's why people have been going back to traditional Mass, to Roman uh, Latin Mass, flocking back. Their young families are being flocking back to the Latin Mass, which existed prior to, what, when did they change it? 19, early 1960s during Vatican II. So back to like 1950-era Roman Catholicism. They want something steady. They want something certain because that's where their hope is, in the institution. So an institution that's shaking and wavering and going all over the place, that's their faith shaking and wavering and going all over the place. Francis is tearing down the object of their faith, their salvation, because their hope is in the institution. Well, the institution can't save you. never could. So let's take a look. But that's a pretty simple ex- explanation for why there's this reaction with inside, uh, inside Roman Catholicism regarding Francis and this fight going in there because their hope is actually in the institution. Otherwise, let the stupid thing fall to the ground. Christ isn't going to fall to the ground. His word's not going to fall to the ground. The gospel's not going to fail. But that man-made institution is failing. It's being torn down from the inside. We've got, there's termites there, and one of them's called Pope Francis. Francis Bergoglio the termite. All right, so let's go over to the first chapter of Ephesians for some hope here. I'm not a Roman Catholic. My trust is in Christ himself. Uh, verse uh, chapter 1 verse 13 I'm going to start here I'm going to give you some context as always or almost always in him that's in Christ you also having uh, listened to the message of truth the gospel of your salvation and having be- also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise no mention of a church institution no mention of the Bishop of Rome nothing you heard the message of the truth, of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believe the gospel, and therefore you were born again and sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the new birth. One of the promises of the new birth is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. He is, who is, he's also called the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of truth, Spirit of God. Same, same Spirit, God himself, Christ himself. And uh, the, he is our seal. He, Paul says that Christ in you, the hope of your salvation. He said, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, he is none of his. He don't, you don't belong to Christ unless his Spirit dwells in you. That is the seal of promise. He is the, the, uh, the earnest of our salvation. He is the down payment of our final redemption, which is the glorification of our body, not our redemption from the, uh, uh, the, the guilt of sin. That's already fully and completely paid for and was paid for 2,000 years ago, but so is the redemption of our body. What we await is not forgiveness of sin, if you're a born-again believer. We await the redemption of our body when we will be glorified together with Christ when he returns which is not after the millennium, thank God. As I said the other day, if we're in the millennium now, I'm really, really, really disappointed. If this is the kingdom of God on earth, Christ reigning as king on earth, hmm, how come I don't know about it? It's... It doesn't look like it should. (coughs) 
Anyway, back to the scripture here. <clears throat> Who's given us the pledge of our inheritance? That's that's their earnest. Uh, you, you could also consider it the engagement ring, the wedding ring. We are betrothed. We're not just engaged. We're betrothed to Christ. We just the marriage hasn't been consummated yet. That is our current status. We are the bride of Christ, awaiting His return. And when he returns, then we are betrothed to him already. We already have, in modern times, the ring. But the Holy Spirit is our earnest. He is the pledge of our redemption. The pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. To the who's, What's God's own possession? Us, the church. We are. We are the church. Even Vatican II says that. The people are the church, not the institution, the people. You know, if you guys were smart over there, you'd, you'd stop looking at Vatican I and start looking at Vatican II, and you'd push the guy out of office. You know, I, I just saw James White talking a little bit about this, and he was saying, well, you guys can't do anything because of Vatican I. Let me tell you, there in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, there's been many, many, many ways to remove a pope. Most of them not legal. But the Vatican State, you know, it's not really part of Italy anyway. Who knows what's legal there? Based on precedent? is pres If you know your history, you know popes often did not die in office. Well, from natural causes, at least. Not that I'm suggesting anything. I can make you suggestions. It's not the institution that saves you. It's faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, like locally here, I could recommend you a, a conservative Lutheran church that you wouldn't even hardly notice wasn't a Catholic church. It looks just like a Catholic church. It'd be hardly any difference, except they preach the gospel there, consistently preach the gospel. But from other appearances, not much of a difference. I've been in many Catholic uh, services. The only difference is Mary's not present. Not uh, uh, visibly. No, she has her biblical role as the, uh, the mother of our Lord Jesus, of the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. I really don't like the idea when you call her uh, uh, Theotokos or God-bearer. Mother of God. That's like, nah. God bearer almost, but not really, because it wasn't his divinity she bore. It was his humanity. So unless you take that the uh, the divine nature of Christ was had a physicality and a location, I don't know. I just, that, that just has ideas associated with it that are, of course, there was some argument about that when they, some of them, went with that. I just, uh, of course, now look at look at where that's led. Now you have Mary being regarded by many Catholics as literally divine, another person of the Trinity. As I saw in one of my neighbor's houses down in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, tres dia. Oh, what was it? Uh, Padre y Hijo y um, María tres dioses, or el, or Madre, it might have been Madre, tres dioses, three gods, Father, Son, and I think it was Mary, three gods. Catholicism. As far as typical Catholics, now my in-laws really didn't know anything about Roman Catholicism other than what you ex get exposed to as a parishioner, which is almost nothing. It is pray, pay, and obey. That is what your role is. It is not, you don't, you're not educated in theology. You probably have never read the catechism. You've never read the Bible. That'll make you into something else, maybe a Protestant. 
a lot of those Catholics right now, they're really Protestants because they're really protesting. They just haven't figured it out yet. You're not saved by the institution. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, now that can go back to the Scripture here. So the, uh, the pledge of our inheritance is the Holy Spirit. It's really the, the new covenant in us, too. With a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Our bodies will be re redeemed. We will be glorified together with Christ when he returns. That is uh, to the glory of God. And we will be in relation to uh, Christ being the firstborn of many brothers. We will be conformed to his image. Oh, happy days that will be. And uh, we will all be walking in perfect harmony with God in Christ, doing his will as his people, as his sons and daughters. Well, actually, there's probably not going to be gender <laughs> in those bodies. Uh, but, yeah, and ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years on earth, as the Scripture says, as Irenaeus in the second century strongly asserted being necessary. And I agree with him. I read his reasoning. Yeah, he was right. Why shouldn't he be? He apparently read the Scriptures. Of course, he got it pretty much secondhand through Polycarp from John himself, the book of Revelation. For this reason, I too, having heard of the, of the faith in the Lord Jesus that exists among you and your love for all the saints. Um, let's see, where am I here? Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, knowledge of Christ, because our knowledge of the Father is through Christ. And no one can know the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son reveals him. So Christ is the perfect revelation of God, really eternally, probably, I would say. Uh, he is the... Uh, he is the one the one mediator between God and man, one mediator between the Father and humanity. Being God and man both. The 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 junction between creation and the creator. The creator himself being Christ. Or Father creating through Christ too. Excuse me. When you start talking about God, it gets a little complicated. Not because it's a problem with God, it's a problem with us and language and our lack of ability. <laughs> How can you understand God? Well, you can, but not you can't comprehend him in his fullness. Or, uh, no, and completely, under, but it, it does say in the scriptures that when Christ appears, we will see him as he is, for we will be like him. We'll be able to see Christ as he truly is. That'll be amazing. Amazing. Obviously, there's going to be some improvements. <laughs> I'm going to experience some improvements in my ability to perceive my Lord and Savior. I just want to see him, the one who saved me. Yeah. <sighs> I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Yeah, we're just talking about there. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Yeah, those who belong to him are the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? Do you know, I'm just thinking, there is absolutely nothing like this in in the Quran, in the, the holy book of Mormons, or Mormons, Mos Muslims. No, sorry, not Mormons. There's no hope there either. Absolutely nothing there. Mormonism is one of the most bizarrely stupid religions in the entire world. Uh, <clears throat> why any, that, that'll just, that just, Mormonism shows you that fallen human beings will follow anybody except Jesus Christ. Uh, 
You want to follow that scammer Joseph Smith. Like, you believe that stuff? You believe Joseph Smith and Brigham Young? Well, uh, what can I say? That is pretty bad. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Scripture says we have been ra- we are crucified with Christ and we've been raised with him. These are in accordance with... Uh, uh, wait a minute, where was it? Raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, that at the... At, that uh, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. That's the millennium. There's multiple ages to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, his people, not Rome, his people, not an institution, his people, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What is the Pope and the bishops and the priests and those institutions have to do with Jesus Christ? Nothing, 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 nothing. They didn't exist when this was written. (laughs) Paul doesn't seem to think they're necessary either, or they would have been revealed. The Bible doesn't mention them. You have to work, work really hard to try to read that stuff into the Scripture, like the Pope. Really? Yeah. How do you, even if Peter was the rock, and that's not what it says, the rock on which he's going to build his church, how does that translate to the Pope? Scripture, please. Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. You have to find an explicit statement that teaches it, or I don't have to believe it. Not that I would believe you anyway considering the lifestyle of half the clergy, would cause me to not believe anything that comes out of that institution. There seems to be something morally wrong there. Like uh, the, the, the wrath of God is upon them for doing what? Suppressing the truth? Yeah, suppressing the truth for almost 2,000 years. Well, not quite 2,000 years. 1,500 years at least. Is his body the fullness of him who fills all things, chapter 2. And you were dead, talking to the, the saints at Ephesus and referring to us all, too. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. We were lost. We were dead, spiritually dead, in which you former walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. That's Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, otherwise known as the sons of Adam. We were all born as sons of Adam, of the water, of natural birth, but Jesus said we must be reborn, born again, born from above, born of the spirit as the sons of God. Otherwise, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. You have to be born of God, begotten by God through faith in Jesus Christ. Among them we too, referring to the Jews and Paul and the apostles, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now the flesh here is what we inherit from Adam. It's our natural life. It is our sinful life. It's what comes from Adam, the fallen Adam. It's not referring simply to the flesh of our body. No. What we're born with is our flesh, as far as the way Paul uses it. Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, children of God's wrath. Why? Why? because we were dead in trespasses and sins. 
We were not what we're supposed to be. We're, we were created to be the image of God. Adam fell. Most of that image disappeared. But the obligation to be the image of God remained. That is what is properly original sin. The fact that we're not the image of God because our relationship with God was shattered and without God in us, we cannot be the image of God. We cannot be the temple of God if God is not in the temple. And for God to move into the temple, it has to be purified by blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you won't understand that, but we, Christ died for our sins on the cross. His, his blood pays the penalty for our cross. The wages of sin is death. Christ died in our place. So through faith in him and what he accomplished on the cross, we can be restored to a proper relationship with God, all our sins forgiven, and given the gift of eternal life. And much more, actually. But that's a good starting point. <laughs> As Jesus said, he that believes in me shall never die. Does he mean he never will physically die? No, he meant you will never die because you've been born again through faith in him. And you have, already have eternal life. Your body doesn't have yet because your body has not yet been redeemed. Your body is still mortal. We await the return of the Lord for the glorification. So do those saints that are in heaven. They wait for that, too, along with us. They have not been glorified yet. They have not been given their new body yet. They await with us the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm glad it's premillennials. So we don't have to wait another thousand years. I don't believe in the pre-tribulational pre rapture, really, either. Although there is a possibility of that. I won't shut it out completely. I just say, mm, I don't see good evidence of it. Not enough to believe in it as a, as a conviction. No, it's not that clear, that's for sure. We're by nature children of wrath, even, uh, even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy. Now, where is Rome in all this? It where does it say we need the Roman Catholic institution and the Roman Catholic sacraments? It doesn't say that. It doesn't teach that anywhere in the New Testament. Huh. And we should go by the major teachings, the bulk of the material. And if somebody takes out one verse here and one verse there and says, here, there, there it is, you must be baptized in water in a certain way to be saved. Well, compared to everything else that teaches something different, Somebody's reinterpreting something. You go by the great volume of material, not by isolated things that are easy to misinterpret or to spin into something else. Look at what it's teaching, which means you have to read it. You have to read it or listen to it. You can get yourself an audio Bible. If you don't want to read, you can get it on... You can get it on... DVDs and put it on a, a pen drive. Spend your time driving the car, listening to the scriptures. Even if you're not focusing on it, it'll work its way into your memory. Then the Holy Spirit can bring it to your remembrance when you need it. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to die on that cross for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, while we were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us, as Paul says in Romans, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We arose spiritually with him when he rose from the dead. That's, that's when... Our salvation was uh, fully paid for. He had to die. It was three days in the grave. The third day he rose again from the dead. That The Jewish way of counting days is the same as the Mexican way of counting days. Or the Spanish way or whatever. They count it inclusively. So it's like today is Friday, so the third day would be... 
uh, Sunday, which we in English in America we usually say that's the second day, right? Tomorrow and the next day is the second. But today, tomorrow, and the next day is the third day. See, that's how they count it. In case you ever wondered about that, why is the scripture at variance with itself? It's not. It's just we don't understand it. <clears throat> and once you find that out, oh, that explains it. Very simple. Just a little bit of lack of knowledge there. That's all it takes sometimes. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that in the ages, plural, to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Where is the Catholic Church? Nowhere. Not the institution. Those who are in the Catholic Church and trust in Christ... You're seated in heavenly places. You have eternal life because you trust in Christ. If you trust in the institution, you're not trusting in Christ. It is Christ himself. It is personal faith in the person of Christ. That's what this is all about. And if you've been taught something else, it can be very confusing. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not faith in an institution, faith in Christ. This goes for everyone, not just Roman Catholics. It's faith in Christ. If your faith is somewhere else, it will not save you. You've been saved by grace, you have been saved by God's grace, his you don't merit it. It's unmerited. It's not something you can earn. You don't deserve it. God's grace is giving you what you don't deserve. God's justice is giving you what you do deserve. You don't want God's justice. You want God's grace because you're a sinner. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The that there is that entire clause for by grace you have been saved through faith. How do I know that? Because that's the way it works in the Greek. We lose some things when you translate things. So it's, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You don't do it, God does it. He gives it to you. Not as a result of works, that no one should boast. God's not going to tolerate sinners boasting about how they earned their salvation. No, 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 no. It's not something you can earn. The very idea that you think you can is dishonoring Jesus Christ. You understand that? You're saying, if you think you have to do something besides trust in Jesus, you're saying what he did on the cross pouring out his blood, pouring out his life for the sins of the world, for your sins, that's not good enough. You've got to add something to it. That's what you're, that's what you're saying. You're saying we're saved by faith plus works. No, 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 no. That's saying that Christ is not enough, and God despises that. We're saved by grace through faith onto good works. That has nothing to do with why we're saved. It's the result of being saved. That God works that God produces in us, but it has nothing to do with what with why we're saved. It's just the fruit of being saved. As it says right here coming up. Not a result of works that no one should boast, for we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, onto good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's work again. Even the good works he's prepared for us are works he's prepared that we should merely walk in them. 
Therefore, remember that formerly you Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed by, in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at uh, that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Talking about them prior to their salvation. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Je- uh, blood, by the blood of Christ, for He Himself, His person, He Himself is our peace. Again, it is Christ Himself is our salvation. Who were uh, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in His flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in uh, himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body, that's the body of Jesus Christ, uh, and the church, to God through the cross. We are reconciled in his body to be his body through the cross, having having it have by it having put to death the enmity, sin. Sin is the enmity. Sin and the law, the law that says that thou shalt not sin. That's the enmity between God and man, was where man broke his unity with God in the garden. The one who was to be the image of God broke that unity with God so he no longer could fulfill his created purpose, no longer could be the temple of God because God couldn't dwell in him as a sinful man because God is holy and just. So God did something to put an end to the sin, to cleanse the temple that he was building for his habitation with the blood of his own son. who died for us in our place, taking the curse of the law upon himself. The wages of sin is death. death. Jesus Christ died in our place. Okay. The whole point being, you're not saved by trust in an institution. You're saved by trust in Christ. Roman Catholics should actually know that, but they've been misled, as we all have, more or less. So the the antidote is to trust in Christ rather than the institution, and then you can basically not worry about what Pope Bergoglio does. Not relevant. And there's no reason... Because your salvation is not in an institution, there's no reason to stay there. No reason to stay there. There's no salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. Salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Read the New Testament for yourself. You'll find that out. Roman Catholic Church is not even mentioned there. Anywhere. Nor a pope. So you can go someplace else. I, I would suggest, it's, it's a little bit too Catholic for me, but I would suggest the, the uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, if you're in the United States. You'll find that, or at least this local one here, uh, quite familiar. There, there would be, there's no culture shock involved in going to that, really. Uh, the culture shock was for me, as even as having been raised as a Lutheran, only in a different denomination, uh, actually attending a couple times an LCMS church. And it's like, I felt like, hmm, I've seen Catholic churches that don't look this Catholic. So that's just a suggestion. Uh, they, they have a similar view of baptism and communion. Similar, very similar to Catholic view. I don't agree with it, but that's where they are. That's why I'm suggesting them. And they're conservative, and they have a high view of Scripture, and they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ. 
reliably preach that, at least from my experience. Not that I've been there several times, or many times, but several. So uh, that's one suggestion I could make, as opposed to doing some real culturally crazy thing like going to a Baptist church. I can't recommend them as being dependably reliable, though. Uh, it's hard to find a good church. It is. And I don't know of many I would recommend at all. Um, I've had a terrible time trying to find one that I can even attend without getting, without being able, without having to get up and walk out. So, uh, yeah, if I was a you know, thinking of a, a person that is a Catholic, that's why I'm recommending that one. Yes, Luther's, Luther started these things, but Luther was a Roman Catholic, an Augustinian monk, and he was seeking to make some adjustments, to, taking the church back to a earlier time when it was more doctrinally sound. So you wouldn't find a, other than the fact that you've left the institutional Roman Catholic Church. But where it is now, what are you leaving? It's just a ruin. Bergoglio is stacking the deck so the next pope will be as bad or worse than Bergoglio is. I've given you my best recommendation. It's not, again, it's not with, out of love. You'd be much better going there because we're saved by faith in Christ, not by faith in an institution. Scripture's clear. Read the New Testament for yourself, especially the epistles, especially the epistles of Paul, that which was written after the cross, after Christ completed his purpose. Before the cross, you get into a little confusion because you still have the law. Christ hasn't fulfilled the law yet and everything else. So exactly what he's preaching, it's a little more complicated to, to unwrap that. But after Pentecost, we have clear and open preaching of the gospel, which wasn't possible before the cross. Because if the devil knew what God's plan was, he would not have crucified Jesus Christ. And he's the one that instigated it. Bet he got a big surprise, didn't he? So, I, you know, I've read the Catholic Catechism. I've actually read part of Vatican I. I have all those resources here. And I did study it because I married into a Catholic family. But... Uh, uh, so I'm not unsympathetic, but I just want you to believe what really saves. I don't want you to see you lost. I don't want you. To, you don't have to spend ten thousand years in purgatory, paying for your sins. Jesus Christ paid in completely for your sins on the cross, and even Catholic doctrine would say that. Absolutely, it would say that. So why did they invent purgatory? You and I both know why they invented it. It's a way to extract money from the people because somebody wanted to build St. Peter's. Just like indulgences. Forgiveness of sin for sale. You know better than that. You don't have to believe those people. They're not from God. Christ is the only one who is from God. And God loved you so much that he sent his son into this world to die on that cross. Of all people in this world, you should be the easiest one for me to talk to. faith in Christ himself. That's where your salvation is. And that's the only place it is.